Sulfur is the most electronegative element we have, and it's water soluble. So it's, it, it is actually an energy carrier. So the lack of sulfur in our soils means that you have a lack of electrical current flow, but not everybody looks at it that way, okay? So if you're not looking at it from the current flow aspects of it, sulfur is a food source, and you can have sulfur deficiency in the plant. But to make that plant work faster or better, um, it's kind of like if, you have, if you're eating sulfur, you're quicker and running faster, but if you have a lack of sulfur, you're just kind of plodding along, and that's the same way with our crops. There's a difference between the one, those that are plodding along and those that are actually producing quicker, and that's probably somewhat of a sulfur component, both in the soil as well as in the plant. Because like in the soil, it, sulfur will manage 10 nitrogens, but in the plant, it'll manage 16. So depending on which place you're using it, it's more effective. Now, can you use straight sulfur on a plant? Yes in a micronutrient form, but it will kill certain plants as well. So in other words, you could use straight sulfur on soybeans and not kill them in the liquid form. But that same sulfur application would kill your giant foxtail, for real. Um, and actually what happened was we had a spray rig get um, gelled, and we were going to try and use acetic acid, which is vinegar, to get the gelling out. And someone made the suggestion of straight sulfuric acid. And so we used a third of a cup of straight sulfuric acid in a straight tank. And we, it didn't burn the beans at all, but it killed the giant foxtail that were the, the escapes, which was really cool to know in that sense. I couldn't tell you what the parts per million of sulfur were, but I knew it was too much for the foxtail, but it was okay for the beans. Mm -hmm. So knowing that those ratios vary between a grain crop versus a soybean crop versus a weed crop, you can use elements to your advantage. It is, it's, it's, one, it's a micronutrient, but it's the most important micronutrient you have because it leads everything else into the plant. So even though we have all the other macronutrients, there's one micronutrient that's in charge. It's kind of like having six little kids and the little smallest loudmouth is up front, but you don't need an overdose of it. You just need enough. But it's the touchiest one of, of the whole bunch, and that's because you can kill plants with it, too. So we do. If we don't understand why our residue isn't digesting, which is where our carbon levels are at, um, the example I used after we got done up front was um, a really good husband does not tell his wife he doesn't like dinner. He says, yes, it's awesome. The plate's still full, the pan's still full. The deal is that's what our microbes are telling us about our residue out there. They don't like what you fed them. They aren't going to eat it. They're going to say, yes, it was nice, dear, and turn around and just go on and hopefully n tomorrow night's dinner will be better. The bad part is, is some of us have residue out there from the last three years. We need to figure out what's missing in the plant residue that's not there. Um, those deficiencies that we're seeing in the plant is creating the deficiency. I mean, that, that microbe isn't there. I don't know which ones bring carpet, um, and copper up, in other words. I know that alfalfa has a tendency to bring up more copper. I know that tillage radishes, because we've done an analysis, I know which ones those elements bring up. So when you're interfeeding that with another crop, I can tell you why this crop got an eight bushel increase because this one provided a good food source for it, okay? Even though it's a smelly food source, it still fed it directly. The bad part is, is our residue out there is missing something. The, the, what I need to do is actually send those off for a tissue analysis and try and start figuring out what is missing. Because you can put sugar out there, you can put nitrogen and phosphorus out there as a digester in the fall, or you can throw AMS out there, making things toddle along faster, but if you still have a few of those micronutrients that are deficient, that microbe's gonna still be like the kid at the table that said, forget it, you didn't put enough salt in it. Forget it, you didn't put enough boron in it. There's not enough copper in it for me. Five of them might like it, but the one that needed copper is gonna say. Yeah, you, we still need to balance it. And, and we haven't been looking at this as a balanced plate. We've been looking at it as NP and K to the detriment of, okay, so awesome. 
nitrogen works, phosphorus works, and potassium works. However, when you've got 10 kids sitting around here, if you're using potassium chloride, you're going to kill five of them. Okay, so now you only have five of them left. As a farmer, you can do that. As a mom, if you kill five of them, you got a problem. But, but the deal is, is it's, it's not that we're actually telling you not to use potassium chloride. Just use a different form of, pota of potassium. Potassium sulfate works. Timing with potassium sulfate works even better. There was a question asked yesterday to Arden about KTS beside the row. I would not use a dry fertility product. I would use another one, and it needs water to work. It will give you a 40 bushel increase on both corn and beans, depending on timing. If you know that, then you're not really not using potassium. You're just not using potassium chloride, or you're not using, I mean, for some reason, the sulfate is giving it feet. It's coming in here, giving you a positive and a negative, and acting as a pretty good married couple and holding them both there together. Whereas when you come in as a single, the water can wash one away. For some reason, when they're acting as doubles, they play better. So 